Hello and welcome to Financial Education for the Nation. My name's Warren Shute and today we're going to talk about property investing. Okay, so we Brits love our property. It's ingrained in our culture. That's different to the Europeans. We love to own our own homes rather than renting long term. And we also love to buy rental properties. Now, as much as I understand buying your own home, I understand that. I don't really buy into the rental property argument in, in building a portfolio that way. Um, or for that matter, a second home, holiday home. Let me explain why. Investment properties are actually more expensive and riskier than the investor believes they are. They see a property valuation, they kind of feel it's never going to go down in value. Um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, um, what can happen. If you've owned one property and you've had a good experience, psychology tells us we then generalize our experience across the board and say that, okay, well, all property investing is going to be exactly the same. Um, I've been in this game 25 years. I've seen it for myself the nightmare tenants, the problems with the property, just when you don't want it, that kind of thing. Um, property investing is a job. You might get away with it with one or two properties. You're probably not gonna get that wealthy with one or two properties, so you need to expand, and then you've got a job. Now, if that's what you want, there's no problem with that, but you know, it's not an investment in my opinion, not like that. The second home argument, you know, they're rarely enjoyed as much as the dream of having one. You know, we all possibly might dream about having that gorgeous property overlooking the coast in a beautiful island um, near the beach. We'll go there and we'll just relax. We'll just spend time there and just relax. But really look at it, guys. How much time can you physically afford to be away? If you've got young children, you can't be away that long because they need to be at school. And, um, you know, when you're over there, actually, the summer in the UK is not bad. You know, you kind of want somewhere where it's not so great in weather and you need somewhere close that you can get to. So it's the cost and inconvenience of going there and you restrict this beautiful world of so many places to go to because you own one property in this area and there's a pool, there's a tendency to say, I now need to go there to get my value for money. And when you do go there, you've got to make sure that the lawns look good and actually make sure the plumbing's okay and oh, do we need to buy some more furniture and a bit of upkeep and stuff. So actually it's not a holiday after all, it's the upkeep of the property. So then you start letting it and allowing other people to use it and then you've got the, the job again. You go back into that job idea. So you know, I'd done the sums with my wife because I was actually all full bent on getting a property. I really wanted somewhere either in um, Italy or Portugal. They were my two sort of go-to places. Um, um, but, you know, being in a relationship, with Dick, Nikki didn't want one. So we, we number crunched the figures and we spoke about pros and cons. And we concluded against me, okay, if I'm honest, we concluded that actually I'm going to want to use this place all the time um, because we own it. And I'm then not going to get to go to all those other different places, even around Europe or the UK, that I might want to enjoy. I know it's not for everyone. You might enjoy owning property. My wife likes property. You might enjoy owning property. You might want a holiday home. So what I'm going to do here is not hold my personal um, differences against it. We're going to touch on the taxation, all the changes that have occurred with investment properties. Currently, we have a stamp duty holiday when you buy a property up to £500,000. That's in place until March 2021. So what that means is you don't pay stamp duty on a purchase of property if up to £500,000 purchase price value, and that's in place in March 21. Now, that could save you up to £15,000 on just buying a, re a residential home. So if you're buying your main home. However, when you buy a rental property or a second property, you have a surcharge on there, and that surcharge is 3%. So that surcharge is still in place, but you still benefit from the stamp duty land tax um, holiday uh, on the purchase price up to £500,000. So you're only paying 3%, so you're still saving about £15,000 if you go up to £500,000 purchase price. So, you know, that's really, really good. I was having a good chat to my friend Dean uh, yesterday and it was bizarre that he runs a big mortgage business and he's very, very busy and things are going very, very well. And you look at it and you think, well, unemployment's rising. How comes it's going so well? And that's the only thing that I can really see um, that's boosting the economy, uh, boosting the property market at least. Okay, so with capital gains tax rules tightening, okay, um, and the likelihood of them increasing over the next 
18 months, two years, um, there are arguments around capital gains tax planning. So capital gains tax is the tax you pay when you buying as buy an asset. It appreciates in value, so you've gained money and you sell it. So after our 12,300 exemption, we pay capital gains tax. And the capital gains tax for buy-to-let properties is 18 and 28% as opposed to 10 and 20%. So it's higher um, on that because they're trying to sort of push down. So one thing you can do is you can look, if you're, in a, if you're married or you're um, in a civil partnership, you can look at sharing the property. So you can transfer half the property. If it's just in one of your names, transfer it to the other. If you're married or in a civil partnership, there's no capital gains tax there. So utilizing both capital gains tax allowances, you have 12,300 each, you could save about £3,444 for a higher rate taxpayer. One thing you need to be aware of though, however, is when you do that, there shouldn't be any, or there won't be any capital gains tax or inheritance tax liability if you're married or in a civil partnership. There could be if you're not. Um, but there is a stamp duty land tax if you transfer over £40,000 worth of mortgage to the survivor. So this is an area that not a lot of even conveyances, if I'm out and fair, if they don't do it all the time, are aware of. Good conveyances will be. Um, so if your property is mortgaged, it's in one of your names, and then you transfer it to your spouse or partner's name, a civil partner's name, in joint names, and you also transfer over some of the mortgage, you do pay stamp duty on the mortgage portion you transfer over. So that's important to look into. Now, when you are owning a property jointly, there's one or two ways you can own it. You can own it jointly, which basically means you each own 100%. So when one of you dies, it goes to the survivor. Or you can own it as tenants in common, which means you each own it as a percentage each, typically 50-50. So where one of you dies, it goes in accordance to your will. So it could go to the survivor, or you could will it to somebody else. And that's typically how two unconnected parties buy a property. So me and my friend John bought a property together. We'd own it as tenants in common. When he died, he might want his share to go to his family. When I died, I want my share to go to my family. But a married couple can do the same thing and then leave their share into a trust. Okay. Now, when you own it that way jointly, typically when you receive the rent, you receive it jointly. So it goes 50-50. So if you own the property jointly or tenants in common, it goes 50-50. Now, you can split that split. So one of you owns 10%, one of you owns 90%. But if you're married, the rent doesn't proportionately fall that way, 10 and 90%. Okay, there's a bit of quirk in the reg legislation where it goes 50-50. You're sti still deemed to have um, received that income jointly. So there's something to be aware of. So if you're married or in a civil partnership and you own the property as tenants in common and you've intentionally done it 1090, so the higher rate taxpayer gets 10% and the lower rate taxpayer gets 90%, okay, under taxation, you're deemed to have um, owned it jointly unless you have completed a Form 17, which is a declaration of beneficial interest in a joint property and income. So it's very important you complete this Form 17 so you make sure that the rental income is apportioned to the people that you want it to. So i.e. if you've got one of you out there earning high levels of income where the other one earns a more modest or low or no income, you complete the Form 17, Declaration of Beneficial Interest in Joint Property and Income and the income, the lower amount of income goes to the higher rate taxpayer and the higher amount of income goes to the lower rate taxpayer. But when you do that, the property will be owned as tenants in common. Okay, so you each own the percentages, 10 and 90 in this example, and therefore it's essential, it's essential anyway, but it's essential that you have a will in place to deal with that property in the event of death. Okay, so that's sort of the main sort of headlines really around the property taxation I wanted to make sure you were aware of. The big five um, this week regarding taxation of property is, um, the first one is what I've just covered, buying a second property does incur an extra 3% stamp duty on the whole property. Now this doesn't matter whether it's a second residential house, so if you're working in London and living locally and you need a property where you work locally, so you're buying a second property and you're gonna share your time between the two, you pay an extra, you pay 3% on the whole purchase of the property, okay? In addition to the normal stamp duty. Buy to let properties, okay, you used to, previous rules, were allowed to offset all of the interest on the mortgage against your rental income. So it's run like a business. We've got £100 of um, rental income coming in. We've got £50 of mortgage interest. One take away the other leaves us £50, allowing for other costs. That's our taxable profit. 
Okay, that's our net income. That's what we pay our tax on. Rules came into place a phase over a period of time, and they came in full effect in uh, April this year, where you can no longer offset the mortgage interest against the rent, and basic rate taxpayers get a 20% credit against the rent. So if you're a high rate taxpayer, you really could be the wrong way around on this one. So you get your rent and you pay the tax on the full amount. You then, if you're a base rate taxpayer, get an offset. If you're a high rate taxpayer, you don't. So bear that in mind. That's something that most of you, I'm sure, are aware of. If you're doing your own self-assessments, you might have slipped through the net on this one. Number three, private residence relief. It's the final tax-free period of when you own a property for capital gains tax. So if you've ever owned a property and then rented it out, um, and then went to sell it, we used to get, I think it was 36 months tax-free. We'd add on to the end. It's done on a pro rata, a proportional basis. If anyone's interested in this, just let me know. I'm very happy to go into a bit more detail or even just do an article on it. Um, it went from 36 months, then it went down to 18 months, and it's just gone down to nine months. So what that simply means is you can only add an extra nine months, so less than a year, onto the property um, to get a tax-free period when you sell it. So that's not very attractive. They're really cramping down or stamping down, whatever the right terminology is, on buy-to-let properties because um, I think the government's view is it inflates house prices. They want to keep that under control for the first-time buyers. Um, and changes have been proposed through the lettings relief as well, where you let a property out that once was your main home. So um, that's another important thing to bear in mind. Um, and now number five, um, which is a real big one, is you now have a 30-day payment window deadline to pay your capital gains tax on a property. If you sold a gain, an asset, on the 6th of April 2020, okay, so the first day of the new tax year, you have the whole of that tax year till the um, 5th of April 2021, and then you don't pay capital gains tax on a normal asset until the following January, which would be January 22. So we went from April 20 to January 22. On buy-to-let properties, you sell it on the 6th of April 2020. You have to pay it by the 6th of May 2020. You have 30 days um, to pay it. I've never been told this, but it's my interpretation that the government doesn't like buy-to-let property. And they don't like buy-to-let property investors. And I think the reason behind it is the majority of buy-to-let investors go for the one and two bedroom properties. OK, snap them up. They can afford to pay a bit more money because they're investors. They've got a bit more money by definition. And then they let them out. And that pushes the price up of the first property, which has a knock on effect to push the price up of maybe the two or three bedroom house, which there's the four or five bed or six bedroom house and knock on effect. So it pushes property prices up all the way up the ladder. It also makes it harder for our youngsters to get on the housing ladder. Um, so they're trying to stamp this out and trying to make it a bit more liquid a bit more easier um, to do so and these are the, so they're making taxation of life debt properties a lot a lot harder um, as with everything there are solutions to every problem there are very creative minds out there and if you own a property portfolio um, one of the things you could consider and as long as you meet these criteria is incorporating your portfolio so although individuals can no longer offset the interest against their rental income limited companies can and a number of property investors are incorporating their um, property portfolio so in other words putting their um, property they own personally into a limited company running it as a limited company having all those um, all the mortgages etc uh, run through the limited companies that means new mortgages on everything and then offsetting the mortgages against the rental in there and you can get a full offset on that you run the numbers. They, I've never done the numbers. They say it works. It's a good idea. It seems a very expensive process for me. I'm sure setting it up is going to be over sort of ten thousand pounds. You've going and got all the rebroking of all the mortgages that are incurred in that way, um, and then you've got corporation tax on the profit of the rent, um, and then you've got dividend tax taking the money out. So um, yeah, okay. It's not. I'm not a tax expert, but you know. It's certainly worthwhile getting tax advice on that. If you do need an introduction, please feel free to get in touch. We won't be giving you the advice ourselves, um, but we do know people we can put you on to if you need to. Okay, main body news this week. So um, the land registry succeeded, successfully succeeded, successfully, I guess they're always successfully succeeded, but they've been successful in stopping fraudulent transactions on properties of more than £74 million. So quick overline on this basically what happens is if you rent a property out 
um, it has been known that your tenants have changed their name it by depot to your name, gone to a sub conveyancer outside and sold your property. Because let's face it, you know, you are Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith owns property. You live at that address. You're now going to go and sell that property. Um, this has happened more than one occasion. Also, um, transaction frauds, taking debts out and loans out against property, that kind of thing. So even if they don't sell it, they just remortgage it uh, in that name. Um, so this is really serious stuff. And all my clients at Lexington, I've always recommended that they uh, register a thing called Property Alert. Now, Property Alert is a free service run by the Land Registry. So whenever any transaction happens on your property, so a secure borrowing against it, someone goes to sell it, someone puts a charge against it, that kind of thing, you get an email through and say, hey, some, this has happened against your property. Um, did you know? So it's great if you have a rental portfolio. So you've got a rental portfolio all over the place. You're going to get an email if anyone tries to do anything against that property, secure a charge, sell it, um, take mortgages out on it, that kind of thing. Um, but also your main home would be worthwhile. And if you have a holiday home as well, be worthwhile doing. Anything that you don't sort of occupy is ideal. Second main body of news this week is the government has rejected the Public Ac Accounts Committee's proposal that the revenue, HMRC, should review pension tax relief. Um, so, well, within the next 12 months. So what they're saying is the Pension Accounts Committee um, have said to the government, hey, there's a, you're giving a lot of money away here with pensions tax relief on pension contributions. You should probably review this, have a look into it. Um, and the government have rejected it. I'm not surprised that they've rejected it because I don't think they're in a particularly strong position at the moment, the way things are going um, with the virus and all the changes that are happening. They do seem to be on the back foot. Um, I'm not one to slate the government, but you know, when Rishi Sunak announces something, it should have been well thought through. And therefore, OK, if we're going to lock down Manchester or Liverpool or Hull or wherever, um, are we going to support the businesses there? You know, let's think about it before we get asked the question. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not surprised they rejected it. But what it is to say is, hey, it's on their radar. It's on their radar. They're aware of the amount of tax relief that they're giving away. So uh, something to be very mind of. I make your contributions now if you can. Uh, Two readers' questions in this week. Uh, the first question came in from somebody and they said, I'm looking at setting up a lasting power of attorney for myself and my wife in case anything happens. Just wondered if we need both or if one of us needs one of the types. What, what should we do? So husband and wife, you both need both lasting power of attorneys. Okay. And what that simply means is there's four lasting power of attorneys in the couple. You need the first one, which is called the health and welfare lasting power of attorney and that deals with all your medical and social care and you need the second one which is called property and affairs which deals with all your financial arrangements your pensions your banking your property your main home and any buy to lets etc what we've just been doing um, both and they all four need to be registered with the office of public guardian uh, registration fee is about 82 pounds um, and um, you do get discounts if you're on any sort of benefits etc there's a list on there you can do um, and you know, it's fairly straightforward. It's fairly straightforward. But you know, get in touch if you need, if you have any questions, by all means. Uh, second reader's question this week is, I have been planning, oh, sorry, I've been given planning permission to section off part of my garden to build a house, which I plan to sell as a separate home. Will I pay tax on this? Uh, short answer is yes. So what this is, is a scenario where the person's had a big back garden. Um, other people have done it. So they're going to get planning permission to section off part of their back garden and they're going to either build a house themselves or they're going to sell the land with planning fish and get the developer to build it and then sell it off. Um, what this individual here, um, when they sell that property, there will be a cost base, i.e. what the land was worth and all the building costs has cost you. And the sale value and the difference is your capital gain. After deducting the £12,300 capital gains tax allowance, assuming it's available for everybody, um, you will then pay capital gains tax on the difference between the two. Um, now that is split between each individual. So um, the more people on there, the more £12,300 you have available. My name's Warren Chute. This has been Financial Education Foundation. Uh, please like the show. Please share it with your friends. Um, the more people who are able to listen to this and get the message out, the better. It means I get more questions. And the more questions I get, the more you learn. You know, it, it, we're not against each other on this. We're all in it together. And the outcome is that we all enjoy our life and we all enjoy our life. We enjoy our life today 
and over the years ahead, all the way up to and way, way, way through, through into retirement. Uh, until next time, all stay safe and thank you for listening.